Hello, good evening. Could I just ask everyone to uh, be seated? We're going to be starting the program in about two minutes. Hello. Can everybody hear me? Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Dr. Paul Laurie. I'm an assistant professor here in the Department of History, and I'm a senior fellow at the Institute of Urban Studies, uh, where I teach and write on issues of race, labor, and urbanization, primarily in the United States. I want to welcome all of you to the uh, final University in the Public Good Class Spring Institute and the fifth Axworthy Lecture Series, or the fifth in our Axworthy Lecture Series. Uh, first, I'd like to begin by acknowledging that we are on Treaty 1 territory in the heart of the Métis Nation and that we draw our water from Shoal Lake. At the University of Winnipeg here, situated in the heart of a diverse and yet often divided urban environment, uh, we confront issues of social justice and the public good on an everyday visceral basis. They're not mere platitudes at the University of Winnipeg. They are imperatives, past, present, and future imperatives of the university. And these imperatives have been very much reflected in our previous speakers here at the Axworthy Lecture Series, whether it be our inaugural speaker, Dr. Cornell West, who's called for an engaged, critical, empathetic citizenry to forge a beloved community, whether it be Dr. Jane Goodall's reminder that social justice extends beyond the human, to encompass a broader ecological form of rights and responsibilities, or our third speaker, Mayor Nahid Nenshi of Calgary, who talked of the responsibility to each other in the pursuit of the public good in the urban environment, or just a few weeks ago, for those of you who were able to join us, Edward Snowden, who made an impassioned plea to preserve individual and community freedom uh, in the face of potentially overweening state or corporate power reminding us that eternal vigilance is indeed the price of liberty. So for today, for our fifth Axworthy Lecturer, we are honored to have Dr. Vandana Shiva, whose work as a scholar, environmental activist, and anti-globalization author has really led the way in the burgeoning eco-justice movement. Uh, she's really foregrounding the role of traditional wisdom and women in this process, has earned Dr. Shiva the title, or often critique, depending on its source, as a leading eco-feminist. Yet time and again, Dr. Shiva has argued that the most revolutionary of acts are the simplest ones, the mere planting of a seed. She notes that, quote, a seed is not just the source of life, it is the very foundation of our being, end quote. 
But of course, as beings, we do not exist in a vacuum and we're formed and beset constantly by contending forces of economic, social, and political power, power which can be violently resistant to change. And Dr. Shiva's contention that, quote, nature shrinks as capital grows and that the growth of the market cannot solve the very crisis it creates, end quote, has earned her the ire of many in power. But as a true radical, as one who wishes in the quite literal term of radicalism to get to the root of the problem in both metaphorical and practical terms, it's with that that we are delighted to welcome her with us tonight and to add her to the family of Axworthy lecturers. The vision of the Axworthy Lecture Series is to provide Winnipeggers access to world-class lectures, provide a platform for vital and ongoing discussion on social justice and the public good at home and abroad. This, problem, this uh, program, I should say, is funded by donation, and we would like to thank our many donors who are in attendance tonight, our friends of the Axworthy Lecture Series, who continue to support these events, to make these events possible. I'd like to extend a special thanks to the series namesake and supporter, Dr. Lloyd Axworthy, former president of the University of Winnipeg, who is with us tonight. But this series isn't just dependent on individuals, it's dependent on you as members of the community, both within and without the university. And we are dependent upon your support to continue to make this series possible. For those of you who are willing and able to lend your support, please contact Darren Nortick from the UW Foundation. The details will be appearing on the screens throughout the night, or you can contact the U Winnipeg Foundation uh, to make a donation to continue to make these events possible. So in terms of the structure of the lecture tonight, it's going to consist of a, a lecture by Dr. Shiva, followed by a question and answer period. There will be people circulating throughout the uh, audience with mics for you to pose your questions to Dr. Shiva. Uh, and so please have your questions ready. And of course, I'll say in advance, and I'll remind people again, uh, we'd like to privilege questions over monologues uh, and to, it's a polite way of saying, please ask a question in the clearest sense of the term <laughs> so we can be considerate of other people's time, Dr. Shiva's and everyone else's. A few other housekeeping notes. The washrooms are located in Centennial Hall and there's appropriate signage to direct you once you exit Riddell Hall. We also would ask you to turn off your cell phones and request that you do not use flash photography or record the lecture. I'd also uh, like to remind everybody, um, once again, that we are here to enjoy the lecture by Dr. Shiva, uh, so to please accord her the appropriate uh, respect. I can see everybody right now fumbling for their own cell phones to turn those off, so please do so. Um, at this point, I'd like to introduce uh, Claire Reed, She's the director of the Masters in Development Practice in Indigenous Development, uh, and she's going to provide you with a bit of background information and then introduce our guest, Dr. Vandana Shiva, who, are we, okay, <laughs> which we will do so now. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Vandana Shiva. So once again, welcome Dr. Shiva, and now uh, Claire Reed to provide an introduction. Thank you, uh, Dr. Lori. So food, what we eat, what we think we're eating, where it comes from, how it's grown and shared, how it heals or harms, what we do when we don't have enough, what we do when we have too much. Food is absolutely central to our lives, and we probably spend more time thinking about food than we do many other things. In most cultures and places around the world, food is meant to be shared. It's what connects us. Through food, not only are we connected with those who are around the table, but we're also connected to the farmers who produce it and grow it, to the land and seeds, the bugs, the sunshine, the water needed for its growth. And in this way, food reminds us that we are all inextricably linked 
as a part of nature and that protecting and caring for nature is not a luxury, but in fact a survival imperative. And one of the leading proponents of this idea is, of course, Dr. Vandana Shiva, whom we are extremely honored to welcome this evening as the fifth lecturer in the Axworthy Distinguished Lecture Series on the Public Good. It's very difficult to sum up all of the extensive and varied work which Dr. Shiva has been engaged in. She is a renowned eco-feminist, environmental activist, prolific author, advocate, physicist, mother, partner, daughter, sister. Dr. Shiva is a leading example of one whose love for the earth, its seeds, animals, and people has informed her hopeful, courageous defense and celebration of biodiversity and indigenous knowledge. Through her research, writing, advocacy, and activism, Dr. Shiva has contributed in significant ways to changing the practices and paradigms of agriculture and food. Dr. Shiva's commitment to traditional agriculture, seed preservation, organic farming, and science as service has led her to work in a variety of spaces, ranging from university classrooms to government offices, to fields in rural India, to activist marches around the world. She is the founder of Navdanya, meaning nine seeds and also new gift, a national movement to protect the diversity and integrity of living resources, especially native seed, and to promote organic uh, farming and fair trade. Bija Vidyapith, or Earth University, is Navdanya's learning center, a university based on living in and learning from nature. The double meaning of Navdanya symbolizes the importance of protecting biological and cultural diversity and the idea of seed as commons, or seed freedom. The time is really too short to list all of the honors and awards received by Dr. Shiva for her vision and proposal of exemplary solutions to the root causes of global problems. To name but a few, she is the recipient of the Right Livelihood Award, widely known as the Alternative Nobel Prize, for her activism on behalf of ecology and women. She is the recipient of the Sydney Peace Prize and the Fukuoka Prize. Time Magazine, Asia Week, and Forbes Magazine have all placed her on their list of the world's most important activists. Dr. Shiva has said that, and I quote, every time you eat, you can make a massive change. Understood in this way, eating as an ethical, political, agricultural, and ecological act can be an act in defense of the public good. And what better motivation do we need for enjoying good food? It is my absolute great honor to welcome you, Dr. Shiva, to the stage. Thank you very much, Claire, and thank you, Dr. Laurie. It's um, an honor and a pleasure to be part of the Axworthy Lectures and in a university that is going in a different direction from many others. And for all of you who are part of it and associated with it, um, I hope you realize how special a place this campus is. And we need spaces like this, which combine thinking, learning, reflection, with community and planetary responsibility, this point of time where the world is getting so divided, so fragmented, feeling so hopeless. Of course, the separation has been cultivated over time. It was cultivated during colonialism, you know, that Alexander, Pope Alexander's papal bull talks about the civilizing mission and all of us as barbarians. Just simple category of separation. And then it got evolved into a separation from nature. Again cultivated that the idea that we are part of nature is an impediment in progress of humanity and man's empire over lesser creatures. Robert Boyle. New England governor. So anthropocentrism was very, very central to this idea of conquest over nature and taking over other people's resources, lands, 
territories in the name of bringing them civilization, even though, especially for this part of the world, it meant 90% were exterminated in the process of civilizing. Of course, all around the world we have indigenous systems that have recognized that we are deeply part of nature. We can never be outside. I say to everyone who thinks they're outside nature, say, just stop breathing. <laughs> and forget the trees that gave you the oxygen. Stop eating and forget the soil and the seed that gave you the food. Stop drinking water. We'd be dead if we were outside nature. We'd be very dead. <laughs> we have a very ancient Upanishad the Isha Upanishad, which has guided our people generation after generation. And it says very simply, this universe, this earth, is for the good and well-being of all. All beings, not just all human beings. Use your share without greed. Remembering that others have rights to their share. And anyone using more than their share is nothing but a thief. Because you're either taking the share of other species, or future generations, or other human beings in our times. And Gandhi summarized this in this very famous quote of his, the earth has enough for everyone's needs, but not for a few people's greed. And this is an ecological principle. It was also in the wisdom of indigenous cultures, which is why it's not an accident that both in India and in the First Nations here, the idea of putting every action through the test of the seventh generation impact is so built in, that you can't take the share of future generations. And for the contemporary time Gandhi gave a talisman, if you do anything, bring to your mind the face of the least privileged person you know. And if that person will be helped by what you do, go ahead. And if the impact on that last person will be negative, stop. So not only is there a separation, an illusional separation that I have called eco apartheid because apartheid means separation, and eco-apartheid is this illusion that we are separate from nature. Um, there's the separation of actions from the responsibilities for those actions, something that no culture over time did, if they had to last. This is, in fact, another very beautiful way that it says, in this Handful of soil lies your future. Take care of it, it'll sustain you for millennia. Destroy it, it'll destroy you. The extermination of that sense of care for the earth, duty to the earth, a duty to each other, which was never considered a punishment, it was never considered a burden. In fact, all rights in indigenous cultures flow from duty and responsibility. And it's a joy performing those duties, knowing you are part of the human family or the planetary family. And working within those bounds doesn't give you deprivation. It gives enough for the real things we need and true well-being, which is why Bhutan, a little country in the mountains, in the Himalaya, decided that they would not chase growth. They would not chase the GDP. They would follow the indicator of GNH, which stands for Gross National Happiness and Wellbeing. And it's in this context that the last prime minister said to me, I can't see any other way of growing happiness than growing organic, so will you help us? And I said, of course I will. And so the Bhutanese come to Navdanya and our farmers go across to Bhutan. And um, 
And we have this annual course, uh, which is, used to be on Gandhi and globalization. How do you transform this very violent model of corporate greed uh, in a nonviolent way? And then the Bhutanese started to come. And so we've added gross national happiness to Gandhi globalization and gross national happiness. It's going to take place end October, early November. There are three ways in which beginning with the first enclosure and the first occupation, what happened? Should I just turn it a little? Oh, OK. <laughs> beginning with the first colonization, the first occupation, uh, new systems have been derived from that. But I think we very often naturalize injustice. We treat it as, as if it's always been around. We naturalize inequality. We naturalize violence. We nat naturalize poverty. And we naturalize greed. All cultures have kept everything vital to our lives in the commons, whether it be the water or the forests, whether it be culture, education, health. These were all the public good and the common good. And the very idea of privatization really begins in North America. And I find it very fascinating that John Locke, who writes about the creation of private property, writes about the Native Americans and not the enclosures of the commons that are taking place in his England, which in a way was meant to make it look like this was about a civilizing mission. And why could you take away from the First Nations their lands? Because they don't lock up the bison. And they don't fence their fields. And the takeover of Australia from the Aboriginal people was based on the argument they could not possibly be developed because they don't grow apple trees. <laughs> and out of this grew this idea of terra nullius, the earth is empty. If it's not peopled in our vision, then they're not full human beings. They are part of the fauna and flora. And I say, of course we are. But even the fauna and flora have rights. By defining us into animals and vegetation. You know, and very often people will say, you're behaving like an animal. And I say, we should. They have more community. And a tiger doesn't eat an antelope all the time. It eats an antelope and then sleeps and rest till it's hungry again. Whereas the predatory system we've created is a system in which there is no sense of limits. And in fact, the awareness of limits is defined as primitiveness. So every system that has been in harmony with nature and had a sense of enoughness is what barbarians become. And I say, yeah, let's all be barbarians. Wouldn't the world be in a better place if we were barbarians of that kind? I have defined in my book, Biopiracy, the whole idea of intellectual property on public goods and on nature's gifts, whether it be water or it be seed or it be uh, medicine. I have called it the second coming of Columbus. The only difference is there used to be a pope then who rode bulls to give legitimacy to it, and we have a pope now who tries to wake up humanity and also has a sad face when he has bad company. <laughs> so for the last 30 years, ever since I heard about the old chemical corporations wanting to patent seed through genetic engineering, I committed myself to build Nafdania and beginning with saving seeds, uh, my own journey of freedom 
has taught me so much more. Because journeys, in my view, are the ends we must undertake every day. They're not just a path to some place, but they are the place where we grow, we learn, we evolve. The second, which didn't actually grow with colonialism, not with Columbus, it grew much later after about 300 years of colonial wars and killings, was the birth of a new illusion after the civilizing mission, the illusion of capital. So I'm j just on a new book, and I was looking at the roots of every one of these words. Capital just meant head. It's derived from kaput, which interestingly has another meaning in these days. But, <laughs> but it just meant the heads of cattle you own, which is how we define wealth, your animal wealth. Now it has mysteriously, genetically modified itself into things you don't recognize. You know, money became capital. Money, a means, became capital and end. Land, earth, people, the creative producers of everything there is that we need were defined as inputs, inert inputs that don't create value. All of value is created by this fiction. And all of economics is based on this fiction. And then 20 years ago, with the financial deregulation linked to the new globalization, we saw the emergence of new robber barons. And the very strange situation that as recently as 2010, there were 388 billionaires controlling the wealth of half of humanity, the lower half of humanity. It dropped to 177 the next year, 250 the following. In, 19, in 2013, it was 92. Last year, I remember um, someone joking and saying in 2015 it became 62, and uh, Winnie, I think, who's the head of Oxfam, said, we could put them all in a bus. <laughs> in 2016, it's eight. You could just put them in a, what are those big vehicles called? We could put them in a minivan, except they're going to, going to shrink, and then we're going to have to need a one-seater. How is this happening? Because we have stopped looking at real wealth and the capacity to create wealth, and the roots of wealth are well-being. That's all it means. Wealth th is the state. Will is the state of well-being. And how do we come to the rule of 1%? Where 99% have no well-being. Part of it is, not only is greed and money-making and accumulation seen as a new religion, and not only are the money-makers seen as new priests, they're actually seen as new gods. And combined with the extraction of wealth from nature and society are the new tools of extraction, which has turned another aspect of human life, of being tool makers, but tool makers to maintain and expand our humanity, always keeping our being human and being of the earth at the center of it. We now have a situation where tools are robbing us of our humanity and destroying the earth. So in both the case of money and technology, what were means, it's not that these have been created now. We've had, you know, you find coins in ancient civilizations all over the world. You find tools in ancient civilizations. So tool making and money are not new. What's new is these means to hire human hands of care for the earth, care for community, creating just societies, enhancing the public good, these ends have been forgotten and the means have been elevated to ends. And we were talking earlier this morning, Carlos, about how they've been made the new religion and the old religions are being engineered also into a political form to support this money machine. 
I wrote my book on the Green Revolution after the violence in Punjab and realized there was nothing like a religious conflict out there. There was a problem with agriculture. The protests were farmers' protests in 84. And yet the army was sent, and the only thing you'll read, go anywhere, go to Wikipedia, go anywhere, and you will read about the Punjab problem as a problem of religion, and it was not. The Golden Temple was invaded. It's a violation of their most sacred site. But the conflict was not based on religion, just as much as the conflict in Syria is not based on religion or the conflict in, uh, in Nigeria. I did a manifesto uh, two years ago with the whole team to try and understand what was happening. Why were people being uprooted so fast? And for Nigeria, the story is so clear. It was Lake Chad which started to dry up, 22,000 square kilometers. 80% of the lake diverted to industrial farming for commodity production for global trade. When it goes dry, the conflicts are between pastoralists and farmers. In Syria, one million peasants were displaced in 2009 by the drought aggravated by climate change. So the reality is that the instruments that we have created both technologically as well as money-making instruments, are actually stealing from nature and stealing from communities, and therefore creating conflicts. I'll just share with you two examples. So I've never really liked this brownish drink uh, called Coca-Cola. <laughs> and I've never figured out why people cling to it. But in 1977, interestingly, you know, after this emergency of Indira Gandhi, we um, had a whole new government. Very, very interesting group of people got into power. And our industries minister of that time just did an audit of all the big companies and found most of them are not paying taxes, most of them are operating illegally, among them was Coca-Cola. So he just said, go out, we don't need you. With globalization, they could come back. And in 2002, I got a call from a little village. I didn't know this village. I didn't know the people. They said, will you come and help us? We are fighting Coca-Cola. So I went down to Coimbatore and drove to this village called Plachimada only to find out why would a group of women be fighting a Coca-Cola. I know people protest on health grounds. And it's the first time I realized that Coca-Cola, whether it's the water they bring you or the drink they bring you, is based on theft. They put manufactured by Coca-Cola on the label. It should be stolen by Coca-Cola. They mine 1.5 to 5 million liters per day at every plant. Now that kind of mining and extraction of water will leave you with a water famine no matter where you are. And the processes they use build up the heavy metals. And so the water levels in the wells were going down, and what remained was not drinkable. So women were walking 10 miles for water. And it was this amazing woman, my Lama, she was 60 at that time, she's no more. She said, why should we walk further? This company should shut down. Lots of debates about how um, there should be soda taxes and taxes on pop. And I was just reading in the news week coming over, they actually are Today, there is, pop goes the world, the world is drowning in soda, which is getting cheaper and more plentiful, except that the water is disappearing. And Plachimada is such a good case, by 2004, that plant had been shut down. So the scarcity for the earth was connected to the injustice to women. And then, of course, there's a third injustice to the people who drink this stuff. I know in India they were putting phosphoric acid in antifreeze and because we are hot temperature, you know, we can go up to 48 degrees, 50 degrees centigrade. So to make you get that kick in the summer, they put antifreeze that is going into cars in your frozen winters into Coca-Cola. But take food. We are food. We're made of food. 
What circulates in the world is food. Again, going back to our ancient um, knowledge, it says everything is food, everything is something else's food. That's the definition of the web of life. That what circulates among different beings is nourishment. The idea of chemical farming started with fossil fuels, started with the wars, and the beginnings of chemical farming was basically the ability to burn fossil fuels at very high temperature to fix nitrogen in the atmosphere and make nitrogen fertilizers. And the argument was this is going to increase soil fertility and it's going to increase food production. The reality is soil fertility is actually going down everywhere. There's data from all over the world, but this is data we've just completed after 20 years of working in Dune Valley with local farmers and on our own farm. And we work with the country's top soil ecologist who comes and does these studies. And I'll just run through some data for you. So organic matter has gone down 14% in the chemical farms. And it has increased, depending on the cropping pattern, between 29 to 99% on the organic. Nitrogen, which is supposed to increase when you apply synthetic nitrogen fertilizers, has gone down up to 22%. And it's gone up up to 100% in the organic farms. Because those amazing beings in the soil are giving you the nitrogen. Something that isn't even there in the chemical paradigm, which says soil is an empty container for pouring nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium into. Zinc deficiency all over the world, there's 37% deficiency in chemical soils, a lowering and a 14% increase. Manganese indicate, linked very much to attention deficit do- disorders now, 17% less. And in our organic farms, 14% more. So we had started to recognize that the idea of measuring yield per acre of a monoculture was just so inappropriate. Because if it was leaving out what you weren't growing and you could grow on that amazing land, it left out the nutrition of what you were growing and this was nutritionally empty food. Uh, the, the data's available all over, how the nutritional content in the US, and calcium has gone down 29%, magnesium 21%, it just goes down by the ear. And we now have literally nutritionally empty toxic mass. Food has gone. And nutritional emptiness won't feed you, and toxics will give you disease. So just working with our farmers and collecting the data on biodiverse intensive farming, our farmers have increased copper, 106%, 106%, magnesium, 61%, molybdenum, 243%, zinc, 64%. This is where you get rid of nutritional deficiencies, by growing nutrition, not by creating nutritionally empty food and then doing genetically engineered bananas. They actually have a project in Australia for India to increase iron in banana fivefold. The iron is 2.2 units in 100 gram. They'll take it to five, four. No, it's 0.22, sorry, it's 0.22. And if they increase it fivefold, you can just multiply. We had wonderful meals today from diversity, whose office I came through just now. That little turmeric, which it's becoming very fashionable in North America, and I'm quite happy, actually. (laughs) I'm even happier when it's cooked in the right way, because you can put raw turmeric or too much of it, and it can be bad tasting. But that turmeric has 65 units. The diversity, the earth is just bursting with diversity. And I think the place where the mechanical paradigm went wrong is thinking everything was just empty containers and mass. When the soil is constantly creative, the amazing diversity of the soil food web that the world is just waking up to. Indigenous cultures knew how to relate to the soil. They might not have had microscopes. 
to see each individual microorganism, but they knew the right relationship. And at the end of it, you might know all those microorganisms, but you still need to get your relationship right to sort this out. Our ancient Ayurvedic science, the science of life, always said the gut is the central uh, organ for health. And they also said we must eat diversity. That's why another reason your diversity food service is so good. They said we must have six tastes at each meal to maintain the balance. I'll just read out a quote from a book on the gut. For decades, the mechanistic, militaristic disease model set the agenda for medical research. As long as you could fix the affected part, we thought the problem was solved. We didn't need to understand ultimate causes. We are just beginning to realize that the gut, the microbes living in it, the gut microbiota, the microbiome constitute one of the major components of this regulatory process. And they're now finding out that trillions of these microbes 550 to 100 million cells. And I just love James Shapiro saying bacteria are sentient beings. So bacteria possess many cognitive, computational, and evolutionary capacities. This remarkable series of observations requires us to revise basic ideas about biological information processing and recognize that even the smallest cells are sentient beings. We worked on so many false assumptions of the soil being empty. The plants, when I wrote my Green Revolution book, every agronomic text said, the plants are factories, and the fertilizer is the fuel. The body in medical texts, we are machines, and the food we eat is the fuel. So when we talk of divesting, of course, there's a little bit of money that needs to be pulled out here and there. But the real divesting, which I think this university is so wonderfully engaging in, is divesting from outmoded fossilized paradigms. Fossilized both in the sense that they're based on fossil fuels, but fossilized because they are so obsolete. We are at the moment where learning that the earth is alive, every being is alive, every being is intelligent. And all of this, the indigenous knowledges and cultures bring to us. Just reading a wonderful book on plant intelligence, you know, there is more computational, going, computational work going on in the root of one plant than in, in our neurons. And they're now talking of the soil wide web. But the word vegetation and vegetable that we use in such a derogatory way, you know, he, she has become a vegetable. The word comes from the Latin vegetalis. And it means growing, flourishing. The verb vegetari means to animate, to enliven, everything opposite of what we mean when we say being a vegetable. And I think the time has come for all of us to become vegetable-like in the radical revolution of our times. It's the biodiversity in the soil, in the plants, that is the real food system. And Industrial farming based on chemicals, chemical fertilizers, pesticides, herbicides, all of which began in the war. Um, I, I have started to call the three giants that grew out of the war, made the nerve gases and the poison gases in the Second World War. I have started to call them the poison cartel because they function like a cartel and all they can make is poison. All they can produce is poison. And the only skill they have is to kill. To kill our monarch butterfly and our bees, to kill the earthworms and the mycorrhizal fungi, to kill knowledges and sciences and cultures, and to kill democracy and freedom. I'm in the heart of big debate on GMO mustard in India right now. They're trying to introduce it. I spent a long evening 
briefing our environmental minister, who is the highest authority to give approvals. And he had said, I know, I'll never approve it. He made it very clear he would not sign the approval order. On the 18th, he was suddenly dead. And I know so many scientists who've been attacked. So many activists who are trolled. I mean, there's an amazing guy called Gary Ruskin who has put out the RTIs, which are revealing so much. <laughs> They've just accused him of being part of the criminal. Kremlin? Yeah. Because, I mean, the big stories out of the border now is everything's Russia. Yeah. Everything's Russia. Um, so when I say kill democracy and kill freedom, I mean it in very serious ways. Entire governments get destroyed. Entire scientists get destroyed. See, one pathetic failed technology which could not do the two things it was designed to do. In India, it, the BT cotton could not control the pests. It's created super pests. It's left us a trail of farmer suicides. And the herbicide resistant crops have given the United States half its farmlands covered with super weeds. And for me, these are very important lessons of where does intelligence lie? Does it lie in the ability to shoot with a gene gun, which is all they do in genetic engineering, or does it lie in that amaranth, palm amaranth, which evolved to be resistant? Intelligence, again going back to the Latin root, is, comes from interlegere, the ability to choose. Every time an organism creates a new evolution for itself, it is acting intelligently. That's why the gut in our bacteria can become resistant to antibiotics. They're acting intelligently. The palmer amaranth is acting intelligently for its own survival. They're now working out a whole new thing. Oh, Roundup wasn't enough. Killing the plants wasn't enough. Let's, and, and you know, there's a big case going on in the US of, on cancer. 800 people have signed for this case. It's a class action suit. That they weren't informed how lethal Roundup is. And they all have, they're all cancer patients, 800 of them. And by the day, more sign up. But the new solution they have to deal with this super weed that's been created by the use of Roundup resistant crops in the US is, ah, you know, we know how to manipulate genes, and now they've come up with a four-year-old technique of gene editing called CRISPR, and they say, oh, now we will manipulate life in order to exterminate species that are a problem. So we will exterminate the palmer amaranth. The only thing is, nature works faster than them. They're already finding that the mutations in the beetle or the plant are making this whole idea of engineering extermination fail. So when people ask me, where do I go get hope? I say, from the intelligence of 300 million species, which will surely be smarter than eight pathetic men. <laughs> it, and the systems they've generated for 100 years, killing, accumulating, extracting, all of the soil Degradation and desertification, 93% of the biodiversity extinction in agriculture. Most of the water depletion, which in my country is so severe, only for extracting water to practice an unsustainable agriculture. It uses 10 times more water. On our farm in Dehradun, I feel so happy. Just serving the earth and protecting seed, we've built up the water level 60 feet. It's come up. We've reduced the water use 70%. And we are growing more food. We can grow enough food for two times India's population. And of course, 50% of all the greenhouse gases come from this industrial system of farming, whether it be the carbon dioxide, or it be the nitrogen oxide, or it be the methane, because it's a system that must create food waste. First, because it works towards uniformity. So every little peach and every little orange that is working its own identity of a particular size 
is disqualified from the food chain. In fact, the very measure of food safety called sanitary and phytosanitary measures under the new WTO rules, the SPS laws, you know how they try to implement them? Again, in a Cartesian way, they take a tray. And if a cucumber didn't slip through because it had a little character and bent like this, <laughs> it was disqualified for being a health hazard. Diversity is not a health hazard, uniformity is, because that uniformity has been cultivated with intensive chemical use. And uniformity in any way is a hazard to our humanity, because we are diverse. We are diverse in genders, we are diverse in races, we are diverse in religions, we are diverse in our faiths, we are diverse in our looks. I mean, every child born in a, fam born in a family has a distinct look. Can you imagine if we thought I, being identical and uniform is all they should be? We'll have the thinking of Hitler, and we'll have the practice of the concentration camps. So diversity is us. Diversity is the planet. Diversity is freedom. And when we take that away, not only do we make the planet sick, we make society sick. The 50% greenhouse gases, there's only one way we can address the reversal of climate change. We can reduce the emissions, and your university has done such a tremendous job as the sustainability coordinator told me this morning. But there's only one way we can pull the excess build up from the sky. And that's because there was black carbon put deep in the soil, which we should never have used but there is green carbon which we can grow. And we must grow that intelligence of the amazing brilliance of a plant through photosynthesis to take carbon dioxide out of the air and put it into the soil. When the stupidity of this mechanical age has only learned how to drill deep or go to the tar sands or whatever. But each of them is highly crude when measured in the sophisticated web of life. It's a crude instrument. And it's a crude instrument where the externalities are much bigger than the benefits, even to a small group. So we did an assessment of the chemical farming externalities. It's $1.2 trillion a year in India for just environmental and social damage. And you have the health damage, 75% disease is coming from these same non-food systems, should we call it? Systems that don't give you food, give you stuff that isn't nourishing. 75% of the diseases come from there, and that would add another 1.5 trillion. So we have the externalities that are three times more than our GDP. And we are not counting those costs. But if you look at the basic thing, 30% of the food you eat comes from industrial farms, which uses right now 75% of the land under cultivation. 70% of the food we eat comes from the 25% land that is in the hands of women, gardeners, small farmers. Now, if this 30% went up to 45, 47%, on the rate of destruction, 75% of the planet dying, 75% of humanity sick, we would have a dead planet. We would have a very, very dead humanity in real terms. Of course, climate change is one very big dimension in this, but disease is another. And every one of these aspects is coming from the same idea of not learning how life works and how living processes work. And treating knowledges, the indigenous knowledges that gave us that knowledge, as if it's superstition. That's how Ayurveda was defined. They tried to ban it in India, the British. I had to go for a 100-year anniversary of our first Ayurvedic college, and they gave me the history, why they formed the college, to defend a whole system of knowledge. It is time for the resurgence of these knowledges, particularly because the next step 
of this war against the earth and war against our bodies and war against our mind is accelerating so fast. Let me just very quickly run through. So 50% of greenhouse gases come from industrial farming. What does Monsanto see as its future? It's bought up the world's biggest climate data corporation. They're now seeing insurance in farming linked to their seeds, their chemicals, and climate data. So if you don't buy the climate data from them, you don't get covered for insurance. They've bought up the world's biggest soil data corporation. They have now joined up with Deere, John Deere tractors, to put spyware in the tractors so that the spyware will collect data of the soil, send it to Monsanto, which will sell it back to the farmers. And this is where the whole idea of big data in agriculture is coming. It's moved so fast, and they're talking of digital farming. I say, yeah, we'll take away the soil, we'll take away everything else. We'll take away the seed, the soil, and you do your digital farming. They've actually created a whole website called Seeds and Chips. Now, one would think the chips are chips or potato. No, seeds are seeds because now they can't ignore that seed gives us food. Chips is microchips. I know you had uh, Snowden talk to you. And I think we need to really just go back to basics, just like the language of decarbonization is forgetting that plants are carbon. We are carbon. That living carbon, we need more and more and more living carbon and less and less and less dead carbon. We can do without dead carbon, but we can't do without living carbon. And our capacity to increase living carbon is the answer for the future. I would say the same goes for living knowledge. Living knowledge is that which is born from relating in a lived world through lived processes. It is not downloadable. Artificial intelligence is a term that's being used daily. And I just collected all the newspapers. How, you know, they're talking about how justice will be done through big data and how all you need to do is download your brain. <laughs> now, because intelligence is so distributed, it's not just here, it's in our gut. Can you imagine how much they'll have to download? Poor Google, their computers will collapse. <laughs> and meantime, those bugs are going to change their intelligence. So tomorrow's intelligence will be different from yesterday's. The idea of artificial intelligence is like the idea of idea of artificial fertilizers, that we can substitute and be better. Yes, every one of these tools as a supplement to nature's capacities and our capacities has a role. Just as a supplement, not as a substitute. We are not disposable people. Our brains are not disposable. So we've got to reclaim our diversity. Navdanya is about diversity. The three sisters are about diversity. We've learned now that agroecology produces more food and does no harm, rebuilds nature. That every crisis we face today, whether it be the climate crisis or the hunger crisis or the disease crisis, the lack of democracy, uh, or the lack of meaningful work, every one of these crises gets addressed by an agriculture rooted in and aligned with the laws of the earth, which are the first laws by which we must live, both ethically and scientifically. And we build up soil, we build up water, we rejuvenate biodiversity. The militarized, mechanistic surveillance system, because agriculture, based on spyware and surveillance drones to keep track of what's going on in the farm, that surveillance system is not a food system. It's not a social system, it's a militaristic system. One century of a militarized mind trying to shape our food system is enough. We did the Monsanto Tribunal to say a century of ecocide and genocide is enough. We will sow the seeds of the future, one seed at a time, one garden at a time, one person at a time, one community at a time. And you've done it on this campus. I've just had the best meals, lunch and dinner. 
And if on a campus it's possible, in every home it's possible. In every community it's possible. Yes, we know they will try everything to try and come in the way. But if we just bypass, I say ecological farming, eating well, nourishing your body, nourishing the earth, is doing the planetary heart bypass. The arteries are clogged with greed. And all we need to say is, we have better ways, and we can do it. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Shivan. Thank you for that impassioned uh, and insightful uh, demand for the ecological imperatives of the public good. And, and the much needed reminder, as you mentioned at the beginning, uh, that it's not, that can't be framed in our stewardship or debt to nature, but our symbiotic relationship in nature and how we, how we approach that. So thank you once again. Uh, we'd like to open it now to uh, questions. There's going to be uh, people circulating around uh, with microphones if you want to ask a question. Just raise your hand and someone will approach you. We'll start over here, Peter. Thank you, Dr. Shiva. I'm Peter Denson. We've met before. I'm so glad to see you here at the University of Winnipeg and hear you say these good things about the campus because this is my alma mater as well. But it, it strikes me that when we're talking about problems relating to systems, industrial, economic, political, and military systems, that relying on those systems to affect the kinds of changes that we need to make in a short period of time seems somewhat counterintuitive. How do we turn that around and find ways of, of manipulating those systems, encouraging the people who are in them to make these kinds of changes. If we rely on the big systems, they're going to continue with business as usual. Well, the food I had was not business as usual of North America. I have to tell you that. Most of the time, I can't eat the food in North America. And I thoroughly enjoyed the meal. So something has changed, and some people have worked at it. And I think it's extremely important to recognize that in places like universities, the students are a very, very important part of the community. And in every campus I know where major changes happen, it's the students who led that change. But more importantly, I think we should not make two mistakes. The first mistake is because the problem is big and the problem is urgent, we must act in desperation. I think we must act in deep trust. And we must do the things we can do where we are. Because in an interconnected universe, every little step that we take connects to many, many, many changes elsewhere. Remember the butterflies and the wings creating storms. So because we are in an interconnected world, we need to be humble about our role while giving our best. And I've often said this, that we are not atlases carrying the earth on our shoulders. You know, that's the image of atlas, bending down like that. The earth is carrying us very lightly. And all we need to do is become part of her energy, her flow, her intelligence, her capacity to change with intelligence ourselves. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, we'll just go right over here in the middle. Um, I just want to say miigwech uh, for um, presenting here, and I also want to welcome you here on 3 1 territory. Um, my name is Sadiqa Musavoy, I'm from Anishinaabe Treaty 1. Um, 
when I actually attend this university, I'm in my fourth year, fifth year in Indigenous Studies, and um, I've been struggling trying to get this university to divest from fossil fuels um, for the past couple of years. And I just wanted to know what were your what was your opinion on um, the university still doing good work in terms of campus sustainability and divest our um, diversity foods, um, but what maybe talk a little bit about its responsibility in um, in terms of fossil fuel divestment and kind of the contradiction in terms of like greenwashing or um, and things like that. Well, first is as I've said throughout my talk this evening, the biggest solution to climate change is how we grow food. Because it's that carbon in the soil and the carbon in the plants that is mending the carbon cycle. So the first divestment, and I said this, the first divestment has to be the, from the fossil fuel paradigm. Whether it be a paradigm in energy or a paradigm in how we produce food, because fossil fuels have gone everywhere. And another thing, you know, in the morning when I wanted water, I was told this is a, a bottled water f uh, free campus. That means you've got out of fossilized water. Because the plastic bottles also come from that same fossil fuels. So it isn't that there's a little box of fossil fuels. It has encroached in every bit of our lives. And every step we take to make the shift is a divestment from a system that's killing the planet and taking away our freedoms and closing our future. And I do want to mention, uh, the other day Stephen Hawking, the very famous scientist, gave an interview and he said, humanity has 100 years on this planet, it's destroyed it so much. And then he went on in his typical way of saying, but we do have an option, and the option is to escape, to find life on other planets. And I would love to tell Mr. Hawking that there's a third option. And the third option is stay home. Stay home and take care of the Earth, our real home. And that's the only option that's going to work because this idea of escaping and colonizing another culture, another land, another planet has left such trails of destruction that we can't afford to carry on on that level. We need to create better lives and better well-being within the limits that the planet has created. And as I said, it's not a punishment. So we need to take divestment and turn it into an investment. And every time you find another path being followed, it is an investment in the system that's going to work for the future. Yes, there's a very strong divestment campaign. And wherever the university community is able to get its uh, university to take money out of uh, fossil fuel companies and put it into better work, I'd say good. But for me, Monsanto is a fossil fuel company. They are the exons of agriculture. And so it isn't that, you know, the crisis is so deep and the solutions are so wide that we need to, each of us, Pick the piece that we do best and give our best to it. And those of us who are good campaigners should campaign. Those of us who are good gardeners should garden. Those of us who are good teachers should teach well. And those of us who are good students should learn well. But it's the diversity of who we are and what we can contribute that is the need of our times and has always been a need for being truly human because there is no one way. There are many, many parts working towards the same end. The same end is one end. The health and well-being of the planet on which depends our health and well-being, our human rights, our basic needs. So it's one end. Let's all walk our diverse paths to that one end. Thank you very much. We have a gentleman right there. Yep. Thank you. <coughs> I have a bad throat. <laughs> Welcome to Manitoba here. Um, um, I used to live on a farm there where the neighbor across from me once a year, a big feedlot farmer with huge, you know, running loaders and all that, feed his cattle, 
But once a year, came to my uh, poor farmer to buy his cattle to, for, to feed his own family with. We speak of Monsanto and its greed. I'm always wondering if you come in contact with him, what do those people eat that are in that corporation? And also, uh, with graduates that are graduating from universities and chemical engineering and all that to go to work for these companies, is there not in the science community some way of uh, analyzing or disciplining or uh, like the college physicians, for example, if you do malpractice, they investigate you. Like, is there no responsibility or conscience of scientists that are working to create Roundup and that kind of stuff? Mm -hmm. So I hope I made it, I got many questions all at once there. So the first thing is Monsanto's canteen is organic. <laughs> they don't eat the stuff. Um, in terms of, you know, when I talked about the monoculture of the mind, I don't just mean it in terms of growing only one crop across all of the prairies. I mean it also in terms of learning systems, in terms of universities. It would be such a tragedy where we do know that the kind of financial system we've built, the kind of agriculture model we've built, the kind of business models we've built, are not really cultivating the future. And to invest all of university learning and training into glossy new buildings of biotechnology, glossy new buildings of business management, and glossy new buildings of financial management is being absolutely blind. We need, like I said, we need diversity. We need diversity of thinking. We need diversity of learning. And I, you know, at, at the Beach Vidya Peet, Earth University, we train farmers of India, but we also get guests from all around the world wanting to learn from nature, learn organic farming. I get PhDs in string theory, chucking it all and wanting to be a farmer. I gave a talk once and I asked the young people in the room, how many of you would be farmers if you could? Everyone put up their hand. So, I think we as society have to be deeply innovative so that our universities are places for learning all the knowledges from all the cultures that have knowledges and all cultures have knowledges, otherwise they wouldn't exist as cultures. We need our universities to be places for working for the common good, which is the theme of the Axworthy Lectures. And if you just work on that figure of eight people, controlling half the wealth. But not only are they controlling half the wealth, their only brain is working at how do you get rid of more people. So they're actually talking of, you know, in India, everything was sacrificed for the IT people, for the information technology people. They're in deep crisis. All the big firms are laying off 5,000, 10,000, 20,000 a day. Some of them come to us to learn how to be organic farmers. Farming, caring for the earth, caring for community, the multiple diversities of vocations that this offers will always be needed. It is time for universities to get out of that hierarchy of man above nature, men above women, white above black, and gambling on the Wall Street casino as a higher work than working with our hands. I think if we need a revolution, it's bringing these amazing hands back into the picture. Great. Did you have a question? Oh, great. Uh, sorry, just, we'll come to you. Go ahead. I'll, I'll be quick. Yeah. Namaste, Vandana ji. Thank you. Namaskar. Shukriya. My name is Zafar. I'm sorry I was late. I was actually cutting grass all day, <laughs> doing commercial lawn care. So uh, working hard, trying to find my way. Um, I'll say first that I think for the, for the first 27 years of my life, I've been fighting myself uh, and, and sort of feeling guilt for being born into the world as a way you know, the way that it is, uh, feeling very trapped and lost. 
uh, until I finally had to make a choice and be intelligent and, and choose life or choose to run away, to escape, maybe on this planet, but to ignore you know, the planet as it is, the challenges that we face as they are. So when you speak about diversity and oneness all together, I mean, this is something that very deeply resonates inside of my soul. Uh, this idea that we are many, but we are one at the same time. That the plants are many, but the intelligence is one at the same time. That the faces and the features are many, but that the soul, the spirit, is one. So I just wanted to ask you maybe if you could say a little bit to us, to the room, about your spirituality and how that has been a guide um, in your own exploration of your intelligence and, uh, and your path. You know, for me, none of these things are sort of floating in the air which you borrow for a little while. You know, you don't borrow feminism, you don't borrow spirituality. You live a life. And you live a life being deeply aware that you are a spiritual being. You live a life deeply aware that you are first and foremost an earth being. And spirituality, you know, for too long we had materialism and spirituality as poles. The problem with the so-called materialism was it wasn't material enough. It didn't understand the interconnectedness. And the minute you do, the earth becomes sacred. The waters become sacred. The rivers become sacred. And then living your life in every moment becomes a sacred act. Eating is a sacred act. That's why all cultures have been grateful for the sacrament. So sacredness is something that grows with the deep awareness of our oneness and our interconnectedness. Thank you very much. Roy, would you have a question here? Thank you very much, Dr. Rashiva. That was absolutely uh, really interesting. Um, my son and I are organic farmers. Uh, part time, we all we have our own little intellectual jobs. Uh, but one of the things that strikes me is, um, uh, I love saying I'm an organic farming, farmer at the University of Winnipeg because it's, it's a really cool thing. My social capital has risen since I've become an organic farm, <laughs> and it has, it has gone down in Steinbeck where we farm. Uh, so my question is, how do we avoid simple dichotomies? We actually have a John Deere tractor that has spyware on it that sends a signal to the satellite. But we get that signal back, and we look at the image, and we know where to spread manure, where not to, where to drain you know, water that can destroy the crops. So how do, we, how, do we, how do we democratize technology rather than demonize technology that could, in fact, be useful? Well, the first is that a particular tool and its evolution, and technology merely means a tool, um, it, it emerges in a certain place. I mean, mechanization of a very large scale emerged in this continent because it had been occupied and then it was empty. Um, but in a land like India, where we have lots of people and tiny farms, the same technology is devastating. I'll give you a very simple example. So the first changed the the nature of the wheat and made it the dwarf wheat, which was the green revolution. And then they brought in combined harvesters. And these combined harvesters, as you know, harvest the head. The farmers can't hire twice to then have someone else cut the straw. So they're burning the straw, a problem we never had in agriculture in India. So how do we democratize technology? by recognizing the diversity of context and therefore the need for a diversity of tools. And the minute there is a taking away of the diversity of options. You know, I've always loved my land because you can have a bullock cart, you can have a cyclist, you can have the rickshaw, you can have a donkey, you can have all of it existing in 2017 and in my view they're all contemporary and modern. There isn't an hierarchy in time. Each of them has their relevant place. And part of what I talked about, technology being made an end, 
is those who find in a certain thing a way to make profits, then work out governance systems to make the rest illegal. And that, to me, is against democracy. I was told the reason they're, you know, they're rushing onto these driverless cars, which is the next big thing, and saying, but it won't work unless you ban the other cars as dangerous. <laughs> now, the minute you have to ban an alternative to push your particular tool, you've already lost democracy. So all I'd say is let people choose with full understanding and responsibility of all the implications and choose according to their context, their ecological context, their social context, their ethical context. I mean, the Mennonites, isn't it the Mennonites? <laughs> who use, who use, uh, yeah? So, I mean, they make choices. You're a Mennonite. The title of a certain book by a certain individual who will remain unnamed. Okay. Person Buggy Mennonite. <laughs> yeah, so. There's a plug for you there, Roy. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much for that answer. Um, yes, there was a student. Oh. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Hi. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Jasmine. Uh, thank you so much for uh, everything that you're sharing today. Um, my specific question is who you, um, you lit up my mind when you spoke about uh, the environmental uh, minister who said no to the action and was killed the next day, as well as academics and journalists who are being exterminated, um, uh, being pushed out of uh, their circles, socially, uh, culturally, politically, and physically. Um, could you share maybe perhaps who your opponents are and what we could do collectively to um, help spread the word as well as maybe what we could do in general as a society to protect those experts and those leaders who are at the front line of saying no, of having the courage to articulate um, their passions and desires. Actually, you know, this sort of poison-based agriculture um, has put everyone on the front line. You know, experts because they have evidence but the poor monarch butterfly, 90% gone. The person whose child dies of cancer because of the poisons. So I think the first thing is going back to the issue of interconnectedness, that this crisis is an interconnected crisis. Of the earth, of the farmers who grow the food, of the eaters who eat it, of every person who fits into the system as a researcher, as a scientist, whatever. I think the first thing is that even though there has been deep violence, and when I, we did the uh, Monsanto Tribunal, we did the violence against the earth, the violence against scientists, the violence against farmers, um, and worked through all the crimes against different people. The first thing is we have to grow our resilience. Fearlessness. Because bullies work on the basis of putting fear in you. And knowing your own interconnectedness and experiencing solidarity. Never thinking of another person as a victim who has to be helped. I, I say this to Tony Blair in a debate who said, we've got to pull the people from out of poverty. I said, they're not in some ditch where you have to pull them out. You push them there. <laughs> Just stop pushing them into the ditch. I think the second thing is we have to constantly remember that at the end of the day, real power lies in us. And we've got to make that, we've got to nourish that power. You know, I think we, we cultivate power. We cultivate hope. Like we cultivate good hope, food, but in cultivating good food, we cultivate the power of people. And in my 30, 40 years of work, I've seen so much change, so much change. And I've seen this poison cartel with all its bullying and all its billions and all its byway shrink into hiding. 
But every authoritarian regime has done what they're doing. Every authoritarian regime has been ended by the commitment and will of people to stay free. So don't think of how to help someone else, just make the change. Yep, we have time uh, for one more question here. Um, yeah, I had a question, but I feel like the very end of what you just said may have um, just answered that. I was thinking of a good way of articulating this, other than um, how do you get mom on board? But that's really my question is... Um, how do you get mom on board? <laughs> She's not on board yet? <laughs> no? G get her to Diversity Cafe and have, give her a good meal. Um, you know, I really do feel a good tasty, diverse meal is such a revolutionary act. I've seen so many people change on that basis. If you just keep on on the basis of data, you know, data just floats or gets rejected. You can't reject taste. It's there or not there. But bring mom to Navdanya. We'll take care of her and make her go through the <laughs> revolution of taste. <laughs> but can I just say one more thing? This already shows the change, because usually it used to be parents would say, how do I get my child on board? <laughs> You're way ahead. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Thank you for all the questions. Thank you. Thank you, thank Dr. You. Shiva. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Shiva, thank you once again for your, your, uh, your generosity with us here tonight uh, and your insightful and inspirational words. It's been, it's been quite an honor. Uh, I'd like to thank all of you once again for attending uh, the last Axworthy lecture of this term. Uh, our fifth Axworthy lecture, and again, to encourage all of you, if it's within your means, to uh, lend your support to make amazing events like this continue to be possible, have access to these world-class uh, lectures right here in Winnipeg. So for closing remarks, I'd like to bring uh, Dr. Annette Trimby to the stage, the President and Vice Chancellor of the University of Winnipeg. So Dr. Shiva, I want to thank you for spending some time with us and I also want to thank everybody here for joining us. Uh, you speak about an interconnectedness and I think tonight we've cultivated the power of many people in the room. I want to thank you for that. I appreciate that you give uh, the people here some hope. As a, uh, an ecologist who learned a little bit about ecology at this university many, many years ago, I'm uh, inspired by the intelligence of 300 million species. I am um, very um, impressed with your comments about there is no one way. Uh, we have diverse people, we have diverse ideas, we have diverse solutions. I think you've all, in, you've encouraged us all to think of a better way, um, wealth and happiness rather than GDP. Uh, if I could retitle your talk, I might have called it the audacity of assuming emptiness. And I will personally be reaching out for food with character and um, I, I, I also really appreciated your uh, comment about divesting from outmoded paradigms, outmoded fossil fuel paradigms. So I do want to thank uh, Dr. Paul Laurie for you know, talking about how all of these Axworthy lectures fit together. I want to acknowledge Dr. Axworthy is here with us tonight. And I, I appreciated Claire's comments about food. Um, we had a, a tasty meal tonight. So miigwech everybody for coming and please continue to come to Axworthy Lectures. Thank you very much. Thank you.